So in the beginning times, I think just let your passion run, right? We're not in the beginning times of this. We've been doing this for 10, 12 years. So this is my 12th year of being a, a, a coach, a strength conditioning coach. So I'm not at the early stage of this. It's the, the foundation's been laid and now it's time to make sure with all the people that are on my team, we're steering in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It'd be so irresponsible now for me to be like, today, just be like, let's just kill it today, guys. Mm -hmm. It's like, that doesn't work. <laughs> but in the beginning, if I had been like, here's where we're going, here's where I'm going, I have my path planned out. I, right now, I'd probably be a strength and conditioning coach for a college and nowhere near as satisfied with what I've been able to accomplish what confidence is has nothing to do with winning or the leaderboard. What confidence is, is knowing that you giving One, your best two, effort three. is enough. One, How are you? Good. Good. Um, talk about something a little bit different today. Um, we, there's, there's, there's no lack of... Uh, thinking big or no lack of ideas or ambition here. Uh, and when I say here, not only do I mean CFNE, but also with the various projects that sort of we're all involved in mm -hmm. um, that you obviously sit sort of at the center of. And I think one thing that is always really interesting to me um, and something that I know that we are always working on um, because we haven't figured it out yet, is this idea of how do you how do you continue to think big and have that ambition and uh, to have you know one year and five year and ten year targets and goals and and uh, um, and those kinds of things, but not get lost in that, not get lost in the in the sort mm -hmm. of the clouds of that, um, mm -hmm. and but by but also you know executing on what needs to happen today. Uh, and this week and this month so that at some point, if you play your cards right, you'll get to that one year, five year, 10 year target. So I know it's something that you thought a lot about. So um, I thought maybe that was a that'd be a good place to sort of springboard into your thinking about one, what we're doing here, because mm -hmm. I know it's not um, random, the things that you've chosen to do in your life um, and then how you think about not only having these great ideas, but then turning them into actionable items right i don't think it's that different than what we normally talk about that's true i think it's uh it's really in line it's about um creating your vision your values and mission and then how do you go about executing on those yep so um um maybe the best way to do this is to give a um a backdrop of what it is when you say like what we're doing here yeah. and um, you say like there's no lack of ambition and big goals to the outside world and the outside world being anyone kind of outside of the immediate leadership team that we have, yeah. it looks essentially like we have, you know, this would be anybody, even like anybody that hasn't been privy to like what we're trying to do as a totality. So you heard it here first. <laughs> um, what we're really trying to do is create a better human race. Mm. And I get it. That's so like um you know altruistic it's yep. so you know utopian and, it's yeah, so unmeasurable yeah and so <laughs> not like a smart dreamer <laughs> type thing like yeah. okay you're gonna everyone you know it's a thing that the millennials want to do is yeah. like have an impact and yeah. change the world right yep. well it's great to have that vision but you have to put it down into greater um tactical actionable meaningful um steps and levers and gauges so you can see if it's happening so we want to change the world by creating a better human race our vehicle for doing that is fitness health wellness disease prevention longevity um staying out of the nursing home getting out of the hospital making people more productive human beings with greater work capacity for a longer period of time mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do here we have a few different vehicles on how we're trying to do that and really it's four one is a pretty obvious one, which is the gym, mm -hmm. CrossFit New England. At CrossFit New England, we have a very specific mission of what we're trying to do there, which is create a family. And we use these words very particularly, create a family of humble, hungry, happy people who kick ass into their 90s. Mm -hmm. That's the deal. That's what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do with CFNE is we have 400 so members that we have a lot of, it's really high touch. We can talking about their eating and their sleeping and their habits and their stress. And we can do it 
four, five, six days a week. And we see these people all the time and we have real influence and we're in the process of, we haven't done it yet. We're not doing this well yet. It's all a building thing. Capture some data out of this. So that's a really cool kind of incubator we have at the gym. The second thing we have, which is kind of the opposite side of that spectrum, is our online online training platform, which is CompTrain. And that is a um, training program that we talk to tens of thousands of people a day. You know, it gets up close to a million views a month. And we have a much lower um, touch, but much higher scale. Right. We can't influence people as much, but the scalability there is huge. So with CompTrain, what we're trying to do there is create an army of mentally and physically strong competitors. And from that, we feel like we can move the needle in terms of the the performance and longevity and all the other things we already talked about. We have a third one, which is called Project Elevation, which is a leadership platform. It's where we do seminars and eBooks and courses and immersion programs. And what we're trying to do there is create a tribe of conscious and effective leaders. Basically, Let's learn, let's let's take this stuff we we're learning that we're doing and then teach other people not necessarily the best way, not necessarily our way, but a way that's working for us. Mm-hmm. And if they're willing, if they think it's valuable, awesome. Yeah. We, there, what we can do is instead of talking to just the 400 members at CFE, we're not just the 10,000 that we're talking to really regularly. That's our really loyal base on um, CompTrain. But we're talking to hundreds if not thousands of other potential leaders, each of them with their own tribes of hundreds. Now we're talking to people in the hundreds of thousands. Those are our three kind of platforms. We have the gym, we have our online training um, program, and we have our online, um, not our online, and we have our leadership platform. The fourth one, which is really interesting, is me working with these elite games level athletes, Matt, Katrin, Brooke, and Cole. Our goal there is to push what is pot- the potential of human possibilities and really try to figure out like, well, where do humans thrive and what is the potential? Like, can we deadlift 500 pounds, yeah. run a sub five minute mile and do 50 pull-ups on the same day? Mm-hmm. Exercise science a few years ago said, no, we know it's possible now. Do these athletes operate better at 6% body fat or 9%? Do they do better with nine hours of sleep or... 11 hours of sleep. Do they do better with this many macros or that? And we get to really use as like, if c e is the incubator, these guys are like the the lab rats on the wheels individually that we're like tweaking the real specifics because the influence we have over there is incredibly high touch, yeah. but so low scale. Right. So the synopsis of this, we have these four pillars that support our bigger system or structure, which is to rid the world of chronic disease, Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, all these diseases that are behavioral, not environmental or genetic. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal. I get it. But that's what we're doing. And it's what we're striving to on a big macro scale is something way beyond a gym, Mm -hmm. something way beyond Let's bring some people in here and show them what we do. Way beyond, let's run a seminar. Way beyond, let's get people better at pull-ups or thrusters. Those are kind of like the the screens for what we're trying to do on a bigger scale. And it's something that, I mean, you know, as you hear me talk about all the time, I am so jazzed up about and so motivated by it. And it is the thing that gets me up at 4.30 in the morning, never having to hit a snooze alarm, is because I believe this is the trajectory we're on. You know, you got me going on a tangent. I'm like, but but I, I believe that in our, if it's not our generation, I'm lumping you into my generation. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Close enough. If it's not our generation, it's our kids' generation. Human beings are living deep, in, well, I shouldn't say deep, well past 100 years old with functionality. Yeah. This is not, you go to the nursing home at 70 and you're in there for the next 60 years until you're 125 or 130 and then you die. Mm-hmm. I believe that human beings in the next dot, 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 yeah. question mark, I don't know, but maybe 20 to 50 years are living to 120 years old and running six minute miles at age 100. That's where we're going. That's what's happening. It's, you know, when we've we've mapped the human genome, we 
are figuring out the gut microbiome. We are figuring out what causes disease. Well, you combine that with what we're doing in CrossFit, literally, constantly very functional moves performed at relatively high intensity, and we're rewriting the possibilities of what human beings can do and the whole life structure of what it means to be a human being. This is not science fiction because the AI is there. We're going to, technology builds technology, and we're going there. Here's a, now you got me really going. Yeah. And you haven't said I anything. Yeah, I've been yeah. talking <laughs> eight minutes. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> think about, think about the, the human species yep. it, from, from when we started, from when we crawled out of ponds, came out of a cave, or you know, were dropped from the sky and Adam and Eve appeared, whatever you believe. From that time for essentially 99.9% of the time, Nothing really happened. Nothing. Nothing happened. And basically nothing traveled faster than the speed of a horse. You couldn't share information and nothing really happened. Then there was the industrial revolution. And also now like, oh, things are going to happen now. Things move faster than a, 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 a sailing, a sailboat and a horse. You can share information. And now because we have the industrial revolution, we have assembly lines, we have machines, we have travel and we have industry and we can really like all of a sudden humanity took a major leap forward not not leaps and bounds not exponentially but a major leap forward then you come into just this is not then nothing really happened until the technological revolution of the 70s 80s, 90s and early 2000s now from then like in the last 30 years we have been catapulted like put on a slingshot and sent into space Literally, 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 like, you know, there's privatized space travel travel. coming. Yep. It's like the amount of like technology builds technology. And now that we're doing this, the learning curve essentially is like a hockey stick, but the hockey stick with all the shaft is on the long Mm -hmm. part. And now it's this little real steep trajectory where nothing happened for, you know, millennials, millenniums. Noticeable. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No drastic major changes. Yes. We went from caves to shelter and we went from killing and avoiding saber tooth tigers to, you know, planting things in the ground and putting up fences and livestock. But then all of a sudden major changes happen. We have the automobile and steamships. Yep. Right. But then real change, real, real, real change is the last few years with the internet. And if you told somebody a hundred years ago that you could talk to anyone in the world face-to-face on a little handheld device and see them talk to them in real time, Skyping FaceTime, they would think you're crazy. Mm -hmm. We're going to bend a tube of steel. We're all going to climb inside of it, 300 of us, and we're going to fly across the ocean. Like you're going to be burned at the stake. You're a witch. (laughs) It's like all these things are happening and they're happening so much faster. The health side of this is a natural, it's going to get caught up in the tidal wave. Mm -hmm. It's going, it's coming. And with health is longevity. And with longevity, you have to have functionality. Mm -hmm. If we all still become decrepit at 70, 70, what a horrible life that is. Imagine that. We also go to the nursing home at 70, but you live to 130. Yeah, that sounds terrible. (laughs) Someone wiping your ass for 60 years. (laughs) Okay. So that's obviously like super big picture yeah, but the big picture is that's what's so important for leaders to have. Yep. That is, I think it's 30% of the job. I think 30% of the job is getting people inspired to come to something bigger than a paycheck. Mm-hmm. And when people come to work here, we get the same like-minded people because I share that vision. Yep. And the people that are motivated by that and want to be a part of it are the ones that are here. And the people that are like, uh, whatever, that's not, I, I want to, I want to get people to go to regionals mm-hmm. or I want to get a paycheck or I just want to be, you know, have CSCS after my name. Mm-hmm. That's not the people we're attracting. So this stems across everything. Create a really big, hairy, audacious goal, really big grand vision that might not be able to be defined by your industry. We're going to change the world, mm-hmm. right? That we're going to create a better human race. And then share it, share it, share it, inspire it, others through your passion. Did you, um, it, it all seems like it was an, it's a nicely sort of wrapped bow in terms of like the four pillars or however you described it. As if like 15 years ago, you were like, here, this is, these (laughs) are the things I want to do. 
Yeah. I don't think that that's what happened, but I'm curious where things started to be right. like, oh, I'm doing this and that's how it relates to this. And that's right. I'm going to pull that. Like, do you have a sense of when it all became like something that feels unified? Um, great question. No, it was a, um, it was a, let's just throw paint on the wall yeah. to start. Here's a great opportunity. Let's open up a gym, mm -hmm. right? It started off as me. So it started off, I didn't have that vision. I was I didn't start in health and fitness to change the, well, I did yeah. actually. I mean, the reason I became a trainer was because I wanted to make people better. I wanted to change it because I, of 9-11, I quit my job as, you know, working investment banking and became a trainer. So yes, I did have that overarching vision mm -hmm. of, I want to make this world a better place. Yes, I want to um, make individuals better and try to, but it wasn't that well defined, yeah. not even close. Yeah. My goal was to just be the best trainer I could that day. You know, get as educated as I could and give as much value to my customers as I could that day. From there, I had the opportunity to open up a gym. And that's felt very much in line with what my because it went from me doing one on one training to okay, I can only work with about 40, it actually was less than that, about about 30 people a week. Mm -hmm. So how do I expand this? How do I get beyond those 30 people a week? Well, Let's get some of these people to work out together. And now I'm doing groups of four, five, six at a time. I did this Ben's boot camp. Mm. That's what it was, yep. it was called. So that led us into this opportunity to open up a gym. Mm -hmm. And from these, you know, people working out four, five, six people at a time, it became working out with eight, nine, 10, 12 people, and then 20 people. And we opened up a gym and now we can talk to instead of 30 people a week, now it's 150 people a week. From there, we had some success with our individual athletes that we got people to the games. And all of a sudden now elite athletes want to work with me. Yep. So I was able to work with these elite athletes, not knowing what I was trying to create in this whole thing, but yeah. it seems like a really good opportunity that seemed in line with what I had a vision for myself. I was passionate about. From there, all of a sudden people are like, oh my, more and more people started joining the gym. We had more and more success at the games. People wanted to hear about what we're doing. So we create a seminar to share what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That morphs into the project elevation, um, uh, platform that we have this leadership platform and then from there um, i just started putting our programming online for our team to follow and that was i called it competitors training because it was a training for our competitors and thus it became the comp train yep still kind of like these siloed things that didn't seem to mesh together all that much except for the fact that we were all inside the health and wellness and we yep. we're all trying to do um, it wasn't until very recently, you know, relatively recently that it really kind of all meshed together and I refocused back on the overall arching goal of what this looks like. And really the only way thing I, I had to do to kind of like make these like nice little, nice little pillars that seem all congruent and seem like I started that way is to find what it is each of these things are trying to do, create a tribe, create a family, create an army, um, and so on. From there, just create like little like missions about what it is for each one of these things mm -hmm. and how they fit into the big picture. So one's an incubator, one is testing the world's fittest, one is sharing our platform with other leaders, and the other is talking to a big scale of people on a on an online training platform. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you mentioned a few times is, you know, as you sort of walked through that that evolution is the idea of like, these opportunities popped up and you're like, that seems like an interesting opportunity. I'm going to pursue that. How did you, I mean, maybe it was, maybe it was natural because it sort of all came back down to that, like that first desire, which is, I just want to help people. How did you figure out what the opportunities were that made sense for you to pursue versus the mm. ones that you said, yeah, maybe that's nice, but yeah. that doesn't fit. And, and as I'm saying it, the thing that pops into my head that many people will know that we did was the ECC. Yeah, um, that was a great opportunity, and for maybe a different team or or a, you know a different time, that would have been the opportunity to chase. Right. But at some point, we were like, that is the thing that doesn't fit, and that if we can if we can remove that, we can focus on these other things that do seem to fit. So I'm just curious. Yeah, the question is no. really just like, how do you deter? How did you determine? Those those are the right opportunities, and those are the, not the right opportunities. Okay, so using the ECC as an example, which was the East Coast Championship, it was a um, <clears throat> pretty high level CrossFit competition. Essentially, mm -hmm. it wasn't sanctioned by CrossFit, but it was for CrossFit athletes <clears throat> um, that we ran in Boston. It had you know 
the who's who of CrossFit coming to this thing. And that was an opportunity that spurred about because we are running competitions at our gym that more and more athletes want to be a part of and the higher, higher level caliber athletes came to. And it kind of just spiraled into this thing that we didn't foresee it happening. We just want to run a really, really, really good event. And it became this monster of this thing that none of us really saw coming until we took a step back and we're like, does this fit? Like, mm-hmm. does this, is this what we want to be doing? Is this where we want to be spending our time? And it was an event that was, you know, you know, grossing hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, over a quarter million dollars, big event um, that we just cut loose. Yeah. We just were, essentially it was, this doesn't fit. This is not where our competency lies it's not where our passion lies and it doesn't seem to fit with the other big picture we're trying to do which is make people better Mm -hmm. there's nothing that's happening there it started off as that because we gave people an opportunity to compete that went away and became these elite athletes it became a showcase and that wasn't really what we were into and no one on the team was really super passionate about it people were incredibly invested into it because that's what happens you put a lot of effort into something you want to see it through You don't want, you want to be successful. That's different than being passionate about it. And when we took a deep, hard look in the mirror and each other's mirrors, (laughs) um, it was really easy to see that that was a a distraction more than a benefit. Mm. And that's the example of that one, one that we created, Snowball and something else. Similar though is, to your point, is saying no to all the bright, shiny objects. There are things everywhere that come up all the time I forget who said it. I want to say it's uh, uh, Richard Branson. Um, he said, um, business opportunities are like buses. There's always another one coming hmm. by. Yep. And I, I think that's true. If you And that's coming from somebody who, who started like 400 businesses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. It's like they're always, there's just so many of them. It's more important to say no to things than it's yes to things. Similar to like, you know, potential affiliate owners that are listening to us. Like, yes, there's an opportunity for you to run yoga classes at your gym. Yep. I don't think that's a good move. You know, we had a person come in, a friend of ours that ran a yoga class for us, one class, just to, um, and then the members afterwards, like, we should do a yoga class. We should do it. It's like, the answer to that is like, no, we shouldn't. We are a CrossFit gym. We want to specialize and excel at one thing. We're not a yoga studio. Yes, there's an opportunity to do that, just like there's an opportunity for us to run competitions. Yep. That's not what we do. Why are we going to try to dilute ourselves by trying to do everything? Mm-hmm. You try to do everything and appeal to everybody, you end up appealing to nobody. Mm-hmm. You become a watered down version of yourself. So yeah, you can open up, you could do yoga, you could do spin, you could do barbell and endurance, you could do everything in between. You could also do boxing classes and guess what? Eventually, you're not excellent. Mm-hmm. To be excellent at something, you got to pare it down. Yep. Now we've pared it down to four things, <laughs> you know, but that's from dozens of other things yeah. that go in line with that. Um, so let's go sort of beyond that just a little bit. The idea of, okay, we've, we've set these big goals. We have this sort of audacious idea. What does it look like on an execution end? How do you then turn uh, those ideas and, and yeah. the high fives that come from it to what happens next? Right. What happens tomorrow? Because, this is what happens. We talked about this with our, our goal setting one. We talked about whoopee. Yep. Um, but people give themselves credit for thinking big. Yep. They give themselves credit for um, being excited and inspired yep. by a goal. And yep. it's not their fault. It's like literally chemical reactions in their body release dopamine and say like, you're doing good. Like you haven't done anything yet. Yep. The only thing that matters is action. And what we want to do is instill massive action. The way we want to do that is by creating daily and weekly accountability. So it's from this huge grand picture of create a better human race to, okay, what are we doing today when we walk in the door? Yeah, That's an awesome question. And it's one that we will forever be trying to perfect. Yep. We use an operating system um, called Traction, um, which is by Gina Wickman, wrote a phenomenal book, has an incredible website called Entrepreneurs Organization Systems. Check it out yeah, if you are an entrepreneur. Is it EOS online? It's EOS worldwide. Worldwide. Yep. yep. Phenomenal resource. All it's kind of like CrossFit. It's open source. Everything's free. It's just amazing, amazing, amazing. But that's the, what we use to create accountability and direction. So basically, you have mission, mission, vision, values, goals, 
all the way down from 10 year to five year, three year, one year, 90 day quarterlies, weekly, and then actionable daily to do's. And that's how you do it. You create this big, huge vision. What are the values? What are the vision? What is the mission of what you're trying to accomplish? Okay. What's this going to look like deep in the future? I don't care what the actual number is, but five, 10 years out and put a date on it. So you know what it is. What's it going to look like? So everyone on the team knows what you're striving for. If you want to, let's say we're partners in opening up a gym Mm -hmm. and your vision is, and we both have these incredible big visions. You want to open up 1000 studios in the next 10 years. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I want to open up one executive level concierge service gym where it's, you know, people are 24 seven access to coaches and towel services and nutrition tracking data and concept. Neither one of those are wrong. We both have huge goals, but we're, we're not going to get anywhere. Right. So define what it is and then share that with everybody. What's it look like? And paint as good of a picture as you possibly can. Revenue, number of stores, number of clients, number of customers, number of employees, number of um, any other measurables you can come up with, anything in between. From there, break that down into what are your one-year goals? What in, in the next 12 months, what are you going to do to move the needle towards that picture? Mm-hmm. Then from there, even more actionable is in the next 90 days, if nothing else got accomplished, they're called quarterly rocks. In the next 90 days, if nothing else got accomplished, what are the three to seven things that you must do? Okay. Then from there, what's the things that you're going to do every single week to make sure we get there? And from there, you have weekly meetings once a week with, with your team and just keep people on track with their quarter, with their, with their weekly to-dos. You said last week you were going to rewrite the operations manual. Did you do that? Yes. Excellent. This week, let's reprint it up and share it with the staff at our coaches meeting. Great. You said that you were going to um, get a draft for a new sign for outside. Did you do that? No. Okay. Why not? Let's discuss that and figure out what the next steps are going forward. Mm-hmm. You have weekly meetings with your team to figure out what are the things you should be doing on a weekly basis to move yourself towards your quarterlies, towards your one year, towards your 10 year. And but mm-hmm. eventually you, you get that. You've created a better human race. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it, ideally, you ideally. know, and let's say it's, so, you know, and nothing's perfect. Everything is, yeah. there's, we don't do this perfectly. No. There are faults everywhere. There's miscommunications. Yep. There's lack of accountability. There is um, every struggle any small business goes yeah. through. We are not immune to it whatsoever. For sure. You know, that's why we call this chasing excellence and not being excellent. Mm-hmm. We're, we are not excellent we're mm. trying to be excellent yep that's maybe the first time we ever talked about that that's true actually um uh, okay so <laughs> a few questions maybe because it goes it just it's so obvious i hope maybe yeah I don't know. um that made me lose my train of thought uh so one thing um a lot of what you're talking about and it feels like you know even back down to to the the whoopee conversation we have a lot of this comes down to sort of like a funnel of big thing and then break that big thing into slightly smaller things sure. and break those smaller things into even smaller things yep. until you get to the point where I have a thing I can do now Yes. <laughs> versus the build a better human race. Great. High fives. Don't know what to do next. And then come in every day and answer your email. And then, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's what we talked about. I think it was you in the last up, podcast. Yeah, you, you end up just getting sucked up into yep. the urgency of everyday to-dos yeah. and never chase the big vision. Yep. What you need to do is prioritize what are the most important things that need to happen to move me towards my goals. Yes. And if you don't have the big goals. You, where are you going? Yeah. Then all you're doing is every single day you're rewriting programming, you're you're turning on the you're lights, the you're cleaning things. the bathrooms, you're doing all the things, the urgent thing that needs to be get done today, day to basis. And all you're doing is continuing on the rat wheel. Mm-hmm. You're just spinning your wheels. You're putting, you feel like you're doing the work because you're so busy, but you're not moving forward at all because you're just doing the mundane everyday day-to-days, answering email, paying your bills, um, you know, working on the schedule, getting classes covered, doing payroll, cleaning the bathrooms, you know, fixing the equipment. And next thing you know, the day's gone and you've done nothing really to move the business forward. You've just been incredibly busy all day. Yeah. There's a difference between being busy and effective. Mm-hmm. You gotta be effective. And the only way you can be effective is you know where you're going. You can be going 100 miles an hour but in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. So establish where the end goal is and then drive drive the machine, row the boat with everyone on board 
towards that one goal. Do you recommend that people, I mean, what is, what is sort of the mechanism you've used to sort of have those bigger goals? Do you literally like sit with a piece of paper and just jot down ideas? Is it like more structured than that? Like, no, the idea, uh, it's just like everything, take a long drive. And- it, exactly. It always comes when I create space. Okay. It's if I am in front of a screen, if I'm in front of other people, um, if I, that's, I, the only time it might happen is when like I'm coaching somebody and talking it through things and figuring things out with them yep. that creates yep. a new level of thinking but besides that it's only when i step away from a screen either mostly it's for me it's computer but rarely am i on my phone or tv so for me it's when i step away from my computer and i'm not um you know presenting or mm-hmm. something like that or even creating you know when i'm creating i'm in there and i'm creating a new policy or i'm doing a new thought leadership or i'm doing something I need to step away, and we've talked about this a lot. Yeah. That, that that solitude is where the big thinking comes from, yep. and that's exactly what you said. It's either long drives, it's in the shower, it's you know drives to work for me are phenomenal. Yeah. I just, but if again, if you're listening to a, sometimes, um, if I can't get into a higher level of thinking in the first uh, five, six, seven minutes, I'll put a podcast on to help like spur me in a direction. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally if you're being entertained, whether it's through talk radio, music, or podcast, it's usually you're kind of engrossed in that. Yep. Um, so it's, for me, it's always creating space. creating space. And as you know, it's like the thing that I struggle with the yeah. most. I think most entrepreneurs do, yeah. but I think it's one of the most important things that you can do is create space so you can have these, what am I trying to do? Mm-hmm. You know, what am I trying to create? You know, as you know, I, I I take some of these walks and I come back and I always come back and I kind of like beelining over to yep. you and you're like, here's here's, <laughs> here's, here's what we're doing. Figured out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that having the space is sort of having the space to figure that out and then building a structure so that you can actually execute on the things that you're thinking about. Yeah. Spot on. So like, as you said, that funnel, right? Yep. Like you can have a vision of yourself, you know, being some you know, amazingly sexy person with six pack and, you know, 6% body fat. And you're so proud of yourself walking down the beach. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do anything to execute on that vision, nothing's going to happen. So what do you need to do? Well, okay. I need to go to the gym six days a week and I need to eat better. Okay. What's the more narrowed focus that when I go to the gym, I need to be doing constantly very functional moves for a relatively high intensity and I need to be warming up properly and I need to um, work on, you know, X, Y, and Z. Okay. That's more focused. Okay. And then from there, okay. What is the things I really need to be doing in the gym? Okay. I need to be doing this because this is the limiting factor for me. I need to work on my hip mobility. Okay. That's really dialed in. And then from there in the kitchen, okay, I need to eat better. Well, it's great to think I got to eat better, but what does that actually look like? Well, I got to do more fruits and vegetables. Okay. What does that look like on a meal to meal basis? Well, I need to plan out my meals because right now I'm just getting things from the vending machine. Okay. From there, what does that mean? It means I need to go to the supermarket three times a week. Okay. What does that look like? I got to put it in my schedule. It's like, so you take these big things and break them down into these little things, which is the process. I was just going to (laughs) say, I mean, that's what the deal is. It's like, can you define and stick to a process? Now, it's nice to have that big overarching goal, but here's the thing. This might be like, you don't need the big thing Mm -hmm. to get there. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't have that big thing when I started. And what I had was the process, which is I'm going to get my clients as most value as they possibly can, try and get as educated as I possibly can be and over deliver as much as possible. Well, I didn't know what I was really trying to do or create, but because I was so dedicated to that process, opportunities arose and things started to move in the right direction. Similar to if you never talk about winning the national championship, but you just dedicate yourself to the process, well, you're probably better off than if you had focused on winning the national championship and ignored the process. Um, Awesome. Last question, just for fun. If we were to go back 10, 15 years to when you just started, first started training, and I said, what are, like, give me the big crazy audacious goals do you have any sense of what it one if they would look anything like they do now or do you have any sense of what they might have looked like before you kind of yeah that's um great question um no they would not look like what they are right now i probably would have said something along the lines of um being a strength conditioning coach for a professional sports team Mm -hmm. because that's all that there there was basically like if you were a trainer you're gonna do one of four or five things it was if you're a personal trainer 
you know, back when I started up, it was you were either going to be a strength and conditioning coach for um, university, collegiate level, or pros. You were going to be a trainer forever, a personal trainer forever. Um, you were going to open up your own gym um, or you can become like a, a physical therapist. That's kind of like the different areas people went into. And people are always pushing me to do one of those things that the question always became, you know, I'd work with these people and a lot of them were real high achievers themselves. And, you know, they, we got to like each other a lot and, you know, they wanted good for me. And like, are you going to be, are you going to be a personal trainer when you're 40? (laughs) And I'm 40 now. It's just so funny to hear that. It's like, and I'm still a trainer. Yeah. And man, like I wouldn't want it any other way. It's one of those things that like if you do start off with the vision too early without like just execution, you might go down a weird path. You might commit yourself to something. that Yeah. yeah. So in the beginning times, I think just let your passion run, right? We're not in the beginning times. This We've been doing this for 10, 12 years. So this is my 12th year of being a, a, a coach, a strength conditioning coach. So I'm not at the early stage of this. It's the the foundation's been laid and now it's time to make sure with all the people that are on my team, we're steering in the right direction. Mm-hmm. It'd be so irresponsible now for me to be like today, just be like, let's just kill it today, guys. Mm-hmm. It's like, that doesn't work. <laughs> but in the beginning, if I had been like, here's where we're going, here's where I'm going, I have my path planned out. I, right now, I'd probably be a strength and conditioning coach for a college and nowhere near as satisfied with what I've been able to accomplish Otherwise, I can't say that, but you know, but, it, but close. I am incredibly satisfied with what I've done in creating the opportunities that present themselves. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that there's a degree of improvisation that you that are gonna that's gonna happen anyways, you know, and you've got to at some point know when improv, you know, improvising towards something new is because some, it's something new and shiny, and mm-hmm. when it's because the old idea needs to be updated or changed. And they call that your gut. Yep. Literally, you you go with your gut, and you can take in as much advice as you want from other people. You know, and it's very important to do that and listen to people that have been down the different paths before, and people that have been super successful and made hard decisions. But at the bottom of it, you have to go with your gut. And one of the examples I'll give there is, you know, when I was opened up my gym, people said, you know, you you got to go in with other people. You got to get partners. You got to get investors. Like to do this on your own doesn't make any sense. And it just never felt right to me at all because I had a vision of what I want to create and I didn't want to have to convince somebody else every decision I made about the whys behind it. And I just wanted to run with my vision. So I went counter to all the advice I got there because my gut didn't allow me to go that way. Similar to the ECC. The gut just said, this doesn't fit. It's a thing we got to let go. And thank God we did because we were able to put a lot of emphasis into creating comp train masters and project elevation and other things that we would not have been able to do if we were still tied to running, you know, putting six months of effort into an event. That'd be soon. Like we would have to be, we'd be like in it Oh, we'd be deep in (laughs) it. We'd be, we'd be right in the thick of it. Yeah. 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 Because it was in January was the event and November and December were the months that were. All right. Uh, Let's leave it at that. Cool. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.